On December 4th, 2016, a 54-year-old woman named Teresa Keel walked into a restaurant in Long Beach, New York. It was little before 7.30 p.m., and she was there to meet someone for dinner. From Teresa's perspective, the evening started out completely normal. In fact, what you're seeing right now is surveillance video of her as she arrives and casually walks towards her table. While this bit of footage might not look like much on its own, that's because you're missing some crucial information. You're not the only one, though. Tragically, the 54-year-old also had no idea what was really going on that night. You see, at that very moment, Teresa was trapped in the middle of a sadistic and terrifying plot, and these seemingly innocuous video clips would become some of the final moments ever recorded of her. If there's one thing that everyone knew about Teresa Keel, it's that she dedicated her life to children. She had a son and daughter who she loved more than anything, but she was also an educator, one who was passionate about helping to shape young minds. Originally born Teresa Ann Albano, Teresa grew up in Queens, New York. After finishing school, she moved to neighboring Nassau County, landing a job with the Malvern School District where she would spend the next 30 years working as both a teacher and a principal. Around this same time, Teresa married a prominent dentist in Glencove by the last name of Keel. Unfortunately, none of the reports we found included his first name, but we're pretty sure it was David based on some records we came across while looking up old dentistry practices in the area. We could be wrong about that, though, so just a heads up. Anyway... After settling down and having two children, Vincent and Francesca, it seemed like Teresa and David were set for life. Between their successful careers and their happy family, there wasn't much else that either of them could have asked for. Sadly, while the good times did last for several years, the Keels were dealt a crushing blow when David passed away in 2004. As you might imagine, the situation was incredibly hard on all of them but particularly on the children who were still quite young. Vincent was 13, while Francesca was just seven. Despite the awful tragedy, Teresa held the family together. She made sure that she was always there for her kids and reportedly became a powerhouse of a single mother. At the same time, she continued to excel at work and was well-liked everywhere she taught. According to several colleagues, no matter where she went, she was that teacher that all of the students hoped that they would get. Even with all of this going on, Teresa somehow found the time to further her own education, with sources stating that she completed her doctorate while still working. She also began to work on creating a local tutoring program with the goal of making education more accessible to the homeless. As she did with her love of teaching, Teresa encouraged her children to develop and chase their own passions. Vincent was athletic and became incredibly good at tennis. He made it to the tournament level before changing paths and getting interested in software development, particularly in creating mobile apps. Like Teresa, Francesca had a knack for academics, and with her mom's encouragement, she enrolled in community college after completing high school in 2015. With both of her children having now entered adulthood, Teresa began looking towards the next stage of her life. Sadly, Little did she know that any plans she might have had for her future were about to be taken from her in the most callous way imaginable. At around 10.30 p.m. on December 4th, 2016, a Long Beach resident named Franklin Kuzma was just about to finish up his workout. He had been running along the city's popular two-mile oceanfront boardwalk and was taking a rest by one of the access ramps on New York Avenue when he spotted something. Just across the street, a woman was walking through the entrance to a small block of apartments. She had made it past the threshold of a doorway that led to a partially covered foyer, when out of nowhere, an unknown person ran up behind her and followed her inside. Moments later, there were blood-curdling screams. To his horror, Franklin quickly realized what was happening. The woman he had just seen was being attacked. Without thinking, he bolted towards the building. As he did, he could make out what was happening through the glass block wall at the entrance. 
the unknown person had pulled out some sort of large object and was using it to repeatedly hit the woman in the head. Franklin made it into the foyer and continued towards the noises. However, as he did, he was seen by the attacker. They immediately stopped what they were doing and took off running, escaping back out onto the street through a different part of the complex. Deciding that the victim was the top priority, Franklin ran over to where the woman was lying on the ground. She was badly hurt, and she seemed to be completely unresponsive. By this point, other people had realized that something terrible was happening, and they were starting to come outside to see what was going on. Franklin waited long enough to make sure that the victim wasn't alone and that help was on the way before he took off running once again. He knew that the attacker had at least a 15 to 20 second head start, but he figured maybe he could still catch him. It seemed like luck was on his side when Franklin spotted the unknown person again just up the road. Sprinting as fast as he could, he started to close the gap between them. As he did, he could see the attacker looking back several times. The chase continued until suddenly the unknown person darted into an alleyway. When Franklin got there, he realized that there was essentially zero light and he wasn't going to be able to see anything if he went down there. Fairly certain that he was walking into a trap, he worked up the nerve to continue on anyway. As he slowly walked along, Franklin kept his hands up around his head, figuring that at least he might be able to block the first blow. To his surprise, however, he made it all the way through the alley without being attacked. Unfortunately, his sense of relief quickly turned to frustration. The unknown attacker had used this extra time to get away. With that, Franklin walked back to the crime scene, which by now was swarming with firefighters, paramedics, and police. It was here that he would eventually learn the victim's name. A crowd of residents at the apartment building identified her as their 54-year-old neighbor, Teresa Keel. By now, it was clear that the injuries she had suffered were truly devastating. She had extensive blunt force wounds to her head and face and was only just barely clinging to life. As she was rushed to a nearby hospital, authorities began to work on answering the obvious next questions. Who could have possibly done this to Teresa? And why? After returning to the crime scene, Franklin Kuzma told police everything he could about what he had witnessed during the attack. He said that Teresa had been walking into her apartment complex alone at around 10.30 p.m. before she had been followed inside and ambushed. Franklin said that the suspect was about six foot three or six foot four and was wearing a hoodie, a winter hat, and some kind of face covering. Based on the person's height and large muscular build, he believed that the perpetrator was a man. Unfortunately, because of what the suspect was wearing, Franklin never got a clear look at his face. However, he was able to show investigators exactly where he had chased the man. With this information, officers and canine units were sent to search the surrounding area in the hopes that they might be able to pick up the pursuit where Franklin had left off. At the same time, Detectives and forensic techs began to take a closer look at where Teresa had been attacked. What they saw told a disturbing story. On the ground, next to the pool of blood where the 54-year-old had been found, were several personal items. Among them were her purse and wallet, as well as the scattered remnants of food, napkins, and disposable utensils, which had clearly been inside of a brown takeout bag she was carrying. Close to where Teresa had been lying, there was a chunk missing from the wall. Chillingly, whatever had been used to hit her had been large and heavy enough that when the attacker had missed, it had left behind a deep gouge in the stone-like material. Based on all of these details, detectives quickly concluded that the crime was likely not random. Nothing was missing from Teresa's purse or wallet, so robbery didn't appear to be a motive either. Instead, authorities focused on the brutality of the attack and the way that it had played out. To them, something this vicious had to be personal. As investigators continued processing the scene and putting these clues together, 
They received word from the search team that had been out trying to get back on the trail of the suspect. They hadn't been able to find him again, and by this point it was clear that he had definitely escaped. While this was certainly frustrating, luckily for detectives, it wasn't all bad news. Thanks to Franklin Kuzma, they knew some of the route the man had taken, and they began to obtain any surveillance video they could find in the area. A lot of this wasn't the best quality. For example, one camera ended up recording really grainy footage because of a burnt-out LED light. But still, the clips revealed a couple of things. For starters, the videos confirmed Franklin's story about the chase, as well as the description of the suspect he had provided. The footage also revealed that the man had been carrying a duffel bag while he was fleeing. Police theorized that the bag might have contained a change of clothes, which could be further evidence that the crime had been premeditated. Finally, and most importantly, the videos gave authorities a better idea of where to look for additional clues. This led to the discovery of one of the most crucial pieces of evidence they had encountered yet. That evidence was the bar from a dumbbell, which was found dumped on top of a container just over a fence in an alleyway. The bar had visible blood on it, and it was immediately sent off for testing. Based on its size and weight, police were almost positive it was the weapon that was used to attack Teresa Keel. With all of this information in hand, Long Beach detectives traveled to North Shore Manhasset Hospital, where Teresa had been taken after the brutal assault. When they arrived, they received a somber update about her condition. The 54-year-old had sustained devastating skull fractures to the right side of her head. In addition to losing an eye, she had suffered brain damage and was in a vegetative state. It wasn't clear if she was going to make it. At Teresa's bedside was her brother Michael, as well as her son Vincent. The 24-year-old had come there after showing up at the crime scene minutes after the attack. Vincent said that he had been out for dinner with his mom earlier that night. At the time, everything had seemed normal to him, and after the meal, they went their separate ways. He had been out for a little while when he had received a call from a neighbor at the apartment complex telling him that something terrible had happened. As Vincent finished explaining his version of events, investigators asked about his sister, Francesca. Vincent said that he had been trying to contact her, but that he hadn't been able to reach her yet. He added that he wasn't all that surprised she hadn't returned his calls. Intrigued, detectives asked what he meant by this. What he said next definitely caught their attention. Vincent explained that near the beginning of the year, Francesca had a major falling out with him and their mother. The primary reason was her relationship with her 26-year-old boyfriend, Ralph Kepler, who at one point had been one of Vincent's close friends. Ralph had a job as a New York City corrections officer, but like Vincent, he had a passion for business and shared his entrepreneurial spirit. In fact, when he heard that Vincent was developing a dating app aimed at college students, he decided that he wanted to be a part of the project. Soon, Ralph and his family had put about $130,000 into the venture, and for a while, things were going well. Unfortunately, they wouldn't stay that way. Unbeknownst to Vincent, while he was focused on the app, Ralph started dating Francesca. The pair managed to keep the relationship a secret for a while, but eventually things came out into the open. As soon as they found out what was going on, Vincent and Teresa were against the relationship. Teresa was particularly vocal about her disapproval. She argued that Francesca was barely out of high school, and she had no business being with someone who was more than seven years older than her. According to Vincent, though, Francesca wouldn't hear any of this. She was completely in love with Ralph and took his side about everything. He said that the more time she spent with Ralph, the more his sister seemed to turn against him and his mom. It had all come to a head about 10 months ago when Francesca left home and moved in with Ralph at his grandfather's place about a 20 minute drive away in the village of Lynbrook. After that, she had pretty much cut ties with the family. Though Vincent said he didn't think Francesca was capable of hurting their mom, detectives still decided to pay a visit to her and Ralph. 
If nothing else, they figured the 19-year-old would probably want to know what was going on. By the time police arrived in Lynbrook, about three hours had passed since the time of the attack. Both Francesca and Ralph were home and seemed genuinely surprised to see them. Investigators asked if they could come in to ask them some questions, to which they agreed. After taking them to different parts of the house for interviews, detectives explained to Ralph and Francesca individually who they were and why they were there. They then asked each of them where they had been that night and what they had been doing at the time Teresa was attacked. Ralph said that they had been home all night wrapping Christmas presents and watching football. He claimed that before that, the last time he left the house was around 11 a.m. that day, when he went out to buy a lottery ticket for his grandfather. During her conversation with investigators, Francesca provided similar details, only she was able to offer more of a verifiable alibi. She proceeded to show detectives a series of photos from her phone and social media. A bunch of these were date and time stamped and clearly showed her and Ralph wrapping Christmas presents in their living room as they had both said. The timing of these photos proved crucial. In particular, a set that had been taken during a 17 minute span between 10.24 p.m. and 10.41 p.m. This was the exact window when the attack had taken place. With Francesca and Ralph seemingly ruled out as persons of interest, Investigators asked them more general questions to see what else they might know. It wasn't long before things took an interesting turn when they brought up the couple's falling out with Teresa and Vincent. Ralph and Francesca fully admitted to the ongoing feud, but said that police were missing quite a bit of information. Yes, they had dated in secret, and yes, that had been a major source of tension, but according to them, that was only about half the story. The other half, which they stated Vincent had conveniently left out during his telling of events at the hospital, had to do with him ripping off and defrauding investors. The couple claimed that by the time everything blew up with their secret relationship, things were already starting to sour between Ralph and Vincent over their business. Ralph said that it was obvious that work on the dating app had slowed down and it was starting to look more and more like the thing might never be finished. Ralph said he tried to push Vincent for information about what was happening, but he was never able to get any satisfying answers. When asked what any of this had to do with Teresa, Ralph and Francesca said that was simple. Teresa had been one of the app's biggest supporters and had helped Vincent to get a substantial amount of money from additional investors. Ralph said that he worried that these funds along with the $130,000 he and his family had put in, were being misappropriated, and that Teresa and Vincent were spending lavishly on themselves. Ralph stated that he and his family were currently in a legal battle with Teresa and Vincent, and had filed a lawsuit against them. He claimed that they weren't the only ones who were angry, though. There were plenty of other investors who wanted their money back, and he speculated, one of them might have resorted to desperate means to try and get it. With this bombshell of a revelation, detectives had seemingly uncovered a whole new angle to the attack on Teresa Keel. However, it wouldn't be long before the investigation would take yet another dark turn. After speaking with Francesca and Ralph and hearing their accusations against Teresa and Vincent, Long Beach detectives began to consider the possibility that the attack might have been some kind of retaliation related to Vincent's app. As a result, they got together a list of all of the investors in the venture and started meeting with them one by one, looking out for any signs of something suspicious. To their surprise though, when investigators started conducting their interviews, they weren't met with anywhere near the vitriol that Ralph and Francesca had described. In fact, most of those affected said that they had been able to get their money back and didn't seem to believe that Vincent and Teresa were misappropriating funds either. In the end, none of them appeared to have any hard feelings, nor did they appear to have been involved in the crime. From here, authorities decided to branch out a bit. Perhaps they were wrong about their initial assumptions that this had been a targeted attack. They turned their attention to recent prison releases or anyone else in the area with a concerning criminal history. 
However, this ultimately turned up nothing. Just as authorities were finding themselves at a dead end, though, they were able to obtain detailed cell phone records belonging to Teresa. What they revealed was quite illuminating. You see, there was one investor in Vincent's dating app who was extremely angry. It was Ralph Kepler, and it turned out that over the past few months, he had been sending Teresa no shortage of threatening and unsettling messages. The communications ranged from text to photos to emails, all of them expressing Ralph's hatred for Teresa and his unwavering belief that she had stolen money from him and his family. Following this discovery, detectives looked back at the surveillance footage they had gathered from around the crime scene on the night of the attack. The suspect's large, muscular physique was a dead ringer for Ralph Kepler. Although this was enough to make Ralph the prime suspect, investigators knew they had a substantial amount of work to do if they were going to build a case against him. There were also still quite a lot of unanswered questions. For example, what about Ralph's alibi? And what, if anything, did Francesca have to do with all of this? Luckily, the threatening messages police had uncovered were enough to obtain further warrants for cell phone records, this time for Ralph and Francesca's phones. What they found there was even more alarming. Roughly two weeks before the attack, Francesca's phone had called a 1-800 number. That number belonged to a company called SpyTech. Police reached out to the business and asked if they could provide any information about possible purchases that had been made around this time. It turned out that they had Francesca's credit card on file. Near the end of November, she had bought a small GPS tracking device. In another lucky development, SpyTech was also able to hand over data from the GPS tracker. As soon as authorities looked at it, they knew that they were onto something. The device had traveled almost exclusively between two locations. Locations that they recognized as Teresa Keel's apartment and the school where she was teaching. Police theorized that Ralph and Francesca had put the GPS tracker on Teresa's car and had been using it to stalk her for days leading up to the attack. This was all but confirmed when they obtained a warrant for Francesca's email account. In her inbox were dozens of automated alerts from the GPS, which had evidently been set up to send a notification anytime Teresa was on the move. As if all of this wasn't creepy enough, additional warrants covering the geolocation data from Ralph and Francesca's phones revealed an ominous pattern. Every couple of days, both of their devices would travel to the same location as the GPS tracker. Detectives realized that what they were seeing were the times that they had replaced the batteries in the device to make sure that it would continue operating uninterrupted. Over the next few months, authorities continued to compile damning evidence against Ralph and Francesca. Among this was information that finally began to unravel their seemingly ironclad alibi. It turned out that just minutes after the attack had taken place on December 4th, Francesca's phone had been used to call the Long Beach Taxi Cab Company. The cell data showed that this call had been placed in Lindbrook. In the minds of detectives, this could mean only one thing. Francesca had placed the call for Ralph. This was his getaway vehicle and it was how he was eventually able to escape from the scene. Investigators contacted the taxi company, and thanks to their records, were able to locate the exact vehicle that had picked up the passenger related to this call. They were also able to speak with the driver who had been operating the cab that night. During a conversation, the driver instantly knew the passenger that police were talking about. She said she remembered the man because of his incredibly odd behavior. As soon as she picked him up, the man jumped into the very back seat of her van and proceeded to duck down as if he didn't want to be seen. He asked to be taken to a nearby rail station and paid about $20 on a $5 fare. With this information, detectives were able to obtain even more surveillance footage from both ends of the taxi's journey that night. When they looked at the videos, there was no question. This was the same person that had been chased by Franklin Kuzma from the crime scene. 
the same person that they had previously noticed looked exactly like Ralph Kepler. On January 24th, 2018, a little over a year after the attack on Teresa Keel, Ralph was arrested. Perhaps fittingly, he was taken into custody while he was at work at the Rikers Island Correctional Facility. He was charged with second-degree attempted murder. Though Ralph didn't want to speak with authorities at all following his arrest, at this point, it didn't really matter. Detectives now had enough for a court-ordered DNA swab of his cheek. The sample would come back as a match to DNA on the metal dumbbell bar detectives had found near the crime scene. Just as they suspected, testing also revealed that the blood on the bar belonged to Teresa. Unfortunately, the situation was a little less straightforward when it came to Francesca. Even with the compelling evidence detectives had uncovered suggesting her involvement in the crime, they worried that it could go either way for them in court, especially since several people close to her had since come forward alleging that Ralph was the driving force behind everything. Friends claimed that the relationship was abusive and that Ralph had brainwashed Francesca into doing whatever he wanted. They said he had convinced her that her family was out to get her, specifically that they were after the inheritance that had been left to her by her father. Ultimately, though, two things would make authorities decide to move ahead with an arrest and charges. The first was yet another warrant, this one covering Francesca's internet history. The results were chilling. In both the lead up to and the aftermath of the crime, she had searched extensively for terms such as how reliable is DNA evidence, how to kill someone and get away with it, and perhaps most unsettling of all, weakest part of the skull. The second thing that motivated investigators to move ahead with the case against Francesca was arguably even more important. On November 10th, 2018, it was heartbreakingly revealed that Teresa Keel had passed away. She had spent nearly two years slowly and painfully dying in a hospital bed before finally succumbing to her injuries. With that, Francesca was arrested and charged with second-degree murder. The charges against Ralph were also upgraded. As they headed towards trial, prosecutors felt that they had built a strong case against the couple and believed that they had now put most, if not all, of the pieces of the investigation into place. They prepared to argue that in the weeks leading up to the murder, Ralph and Francesca together had plotted to kill Teresa. They had acquired the GPS device from Spytech to track her and had familiarized themselves with her movements. On the night of December 4th, Francesca got the alert that her mother had driven to dinner, at which time Ralph traveled to her apartment to wait for her. As he carried out the attack, Francesca got to work preparing their alibi. It appears that this part of the case was the most speculative, as it's unclear if police ever found concrete evidence as to exactly how Francesca faked the timestamp photos. However, according to one source, investigators concluded that she and Ralph had likely taken the photos earlier that night, then sent them to a burner phone or some kind of cloud-based app, temporarily deleting them from Francesca's phone. Just before 10.30 p.m., when Francesca knew that Ralph would be attacking Teresa, it's believed that she downloaded or sent the photos back to her device, which she then posted to social media. Police theorized that at least one burner phone was likely used, because it would also explain how Ralph was able to contact Francesca after the murder. She then called the Long Beach Taxi Company and arranged his getaway vehicle. Though Ralph and Francesca denied any wrongdoing and continued to claim that they were innocent for months after their arrests, eventually, both of them agreed to accept plea deals. Ralph agreed to plead guilty to second-degree murder, second-degree conspiracy, and fourth-degree criminal possession of a weapon, and in June of 2020, was sentenced to 22 years to life in prison. It appears that authorities still had their doubts about securing a murder conviction against Francesca at trial, so they offered her a lesser charge of first-degree manslaughter instead. The plea was given on the condition that she spend at least 13 years in prison, to which she agreed. At the time of this recording, both Francesca Keel and Ralph Kepler remain incarcerated. 
According to prison records, Ralph will be eligible for parole in 2040 when he is 50 years old, while Francesca will be eligible in 2029 at the age of 32. I don't know about you, but for me, this case was one of the most heartbreaking betrayals I have ever come across. Teresa Keel devoted so much of her time to ensuring that her two children would have the best lives possible, only for one of them to stab her in the back and completely throw away that life in the process. Not to mention the fact that Francesca and Ralph tried to make it look like Teresa and Vincent were actually the ones that were guilty. By the way, it appears that the lawsuit against them never amounted to anything and was eventually discontinued. More than anything, though, the thing I haven't been able to get out of my head since I started researching this story is the thought of Teresa happily walking through the restaurant to meet her son that fateful night and the haunting realization that neither of them knew this was the last meal they would ever share together. Before we wrap up, We'd like to take a second to give a huge shout out to everyone who has made it this far into the video. Seriously, thank you so much for watching. If you found today's upload interesting and informative, we'd be honored if you consider liking and subscribing, as well as hitting the notification bell and selecting all notifications to stay up to date with our latest releases. If you're looking for additional ways to help support the channel, we'd love to have you join us over on Patreon. Patrons get ad-free and early access to all of our content, as well as four additional stories per week for each of our Crimes of the Week and Crimes of the Week International videos. You can learn more at patreon.com slash crimezone, where you'll also find some of the fine folks whose names are currently on screen. All that being said, we understand that not everyone has the means to support financially, and that's totally okay. We appreciate every like, sub, share, and comment that you send our way. Once again, Thanks so much, everyone, and take care.